Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the second evening of our Equine Industry Symposium. And I am going to hand it over to one of my students, Emma Boroditsky, to kick us off tonight. Emma? Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Welcome to the fifth annual Equine Industry Symposium. My name is Emma Borditsky. I'm a fourth year student in the Bachelor of Bioresource Management program at the University of Guelph, majoring in equine management, and I'll be emceeing tonight's event. Accompanying me in hosting tonight's event are my colleagues, Kyla Weber, Stephanie Mackay, and Chloe Banker, who are all second year students also majoring in equine management. This week's symposium is hosted by the University of Guelph with help from our partners at Equestrian Canada and Ontario Equestrian. The Equine History Symposium is an, is an educational marketing and outreach tool used to engage all sectors of the equine industry and connect us through topics of common ground. This year being the impact of COVID-19 pandemic on the industry and the welfare of our horses. For those who are joining us for the first time tonight, our symposium topic this year uh, is resilience, rethinking, restructuring and reevaluating due to COVID-19. Yesterday, our panelists discussed pandemic impacts on various sectors of the equine community, leading us into today's topic of, of discussion, restructuring the business for success. I would like to thank our four guest speakers for being with us today. Dr. Melanie Barham, Sir Sean Jones, Catherine Wilson, and Mike King are all experts in their field, and I'm personally very excited to hear what they have to contribute to today's topic. During all the sessions, we would like to promote proper netiquette during the entire evening. Uh, we ask that everyone's cameras be turned off and your mics be muted throughout the entire event. Um, after each speaker presents, we'll have a short Q&A session for you to ask any questions you may have, um, which my colleague Kyla will kindly ask our speakers on your behalf. The question periods will take about five minutes um, after each panelist has present presented and at the end of the evening for any outstanding questions left for our speakers. For our friends who cannot join us due to time change or other circumstances, we will be recording all the sessions and make them available at a later date. So just keep this in mind as we work through the evening. This year has not been easy for anyone, um, some worse off than others. So our hope for today is to enlighten, inform and activate the movement toward restructuring our business for success. We hope that the information shared today will help everyone in one way or another and over time contribute to improving the industry. Now, without further ado, I would like to hand it over to my colleague, Stephanie, to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Melanie Barham. Thank you, Emma. Dr. Melanie Barham is a veterinarian and project management professional and an MBA candidate with a major in sustainable commerce. She currently works at the University of Guelph within the Animal Health Laboratory, but holds diverse experience in both equine practices, teaching within the BBRM program and consulting roles. She is an FEI veterinarian and was the equine anti-doping veterinarian for the 2015 Pan Am Games and Royal Winter Fair. She lives in Guelph with her family on a hobby farm with bees, horses, and chickens. Without any further ado, I'll now hand it over to Dr. Barham to discuss how one can build, pivot, and recession-proof their equine-related business amidst these unprecedented times. Hi, everybody. I'm just going to share my screen. Tonight, we're going to talk a little bit. I have 10 minutes, and we're going to talk a little bit about building a business plan um, so that you can get clear on what it is that you're going that um, that what your business is meant to do and how that can be exciting and really quick uh, really quite a positive thing for your business um, so the topic that I chose was uh, the, t the title that I chose was business plans are exciting and here's why I'm not crazy to say that a lot of you might groan when you think of thinking of business plans or about uh, budgeting but it can be a really exciting and important uh, step for your business to take whether you're a brand new business or whether you have been in operation for many many years so when we think about a business plan um, there's obviously there's a budgeting side that goes along with a business plan but what we're going to focus on mostly is um, is on the big picture stuff that goes along with the business plan where you actually write down, um, focusing on your value proposition. So it is a big picture understanding of your business, what you do, how you do it, and your big awesome plans for the future. And it takes all the ideas that you might have rolling around in your head and, you know, you might have a great idea of who you serve and what you actually do and what matters to you, but until you put them down on paper or virtually, you know, into a document, 
they are kind of a little bit ethereal. So it's important to do that. And there is really good evidence that being able to write them down really is a um, really is no matter what stage your business is in is really important to making those goals happen and making those um, making making clear some of the things that you might have thought about and ideas that you might have had. And the reasons that you should care about having a business plan, um, you know, we're talking a little bit about pivoting and being able to move our businesses in different directions. And we've seen lots of really cool things that equine businesses and other sectors have been able to do. So a great example that I always think of when I think of why it's important to have a business plan and have your values and have what you really, what's really important to you written down. Um, so Netflix, for example, they started out as being a rent, a video rental uh, company. But what they actually, when, you know, when they're looking at what they actually do, they're, what they actually do is bring entertainment to people's homes. So while Blockbuster got left behind, Netflix was able to pivot and invested in, um, invested in being able to deliver stuff without having physical media. So they were able to surpass Blockbuster and, and most other competitors because they were really clear on what it was that they actually did and what they valued. They valued bringing high quality stuff to their high quality entertainment to their uh, stakeholders, to their clients. Um, they valued um, bringing people together, um, but they didn't care. It didn't have to hinge upon physical media. So being able to pivot is crucial. Um, is a crucial skill for any business. But you can't do that unless you get clear on what it is that you do and who you serve and how you do that. But further, but in addition to that, um, you can you really need it. You need a business plan in order to get loans or grants. Um, if you ever had, ever had to go into the bank and ask for a loan, you've likely had to provide a business plan of some kind. Um, and certainly with grants and things like that, you need to provide some kind of idea of what your business is and being able to pitch to other people as well as pitching to your clients and potential clients as far as what it is that you do and how you do it differently than any other equine business out there. Additionally, you know, when you start a business and when you, and maybe if you've been in business for a long time, you may remember this from your early days where you're just happy to get cash in the door and you want, and you say yes to absolutely everything um, until you learn what you're really all about. And it helps you to say no to the things that aren't really for you and yes to the things that are really great opportunities to help you grow and to achieve your bigger goals. But if we never have our goals written down, then we never understand, um, then it, it makes it harder and it muddies the waters as far as saying yes or no to what is a good opportunity. It also identifies some gaps and opportunities, like where are your skill sets and where are your strengths really, and where can you lend value to other, er whether, where can you lend value to the industry and where do you need help? And furthermore, if, you know, if anybody's ever set a goal and, you know, you, you probably, if you own a business that, um, that coaches clients, you know that you're always coaching your clients to achieve goals. And if they don't have a milestone or some marker, it's pretty hard to know if you, if you ever succeeded in that goal. So creating a business plan is a lot about getting clear on what it is that you do and how you do it. And then also about you know, not leaving money on the table. Um, other sectors and many other areas are able to access grants and lots of entrepreneurs, which is really what all equine business owners are, entrepreneurs, um, you know, there are lots of programs that are available to help us succeed and lots of resources. And we're going to talk a little bit about those too. So legitimate businesses have business plans. So how do we make one and how do we make it not an awful, boring and um, arduous process and a plan that we're just going to leave in our desk drawer and never look at again. So there are two business plans that you can, that, that I generally try to, to look at, and particularly if you're starting or if you've not done this before. So there are two that I really like. One is called the Lean Business Canvas, and then there's a formal business plan. The formal business plan focuses more on, it looks at the financial side as well as bringing in some of the legal and the business structure um, and it kind of and it goes through a lot of the a lot of the big picture stuff and some nitty gritty stuff. And that's what a lot of banks will need to see if you are going in to get a loan. Um, the Lean Business Canvas is a great one, though, if you want to try to nail down and get started in this in this process, if you've never done it before. Um, and it is a, it's an easy one page thing. It asks you about what's your value proposition. So how do you serve people and how do you do it? Um, who are your customer segments? Uh, so are you serving, 
you know, are you serving the adult amateur crowd? Are you serving, um, are you serving trail riders, whatever those might be? Um, how are you reaching them? So it is a much simpler uh, process and there's tons of YouTube videos on how to do those. I'm gonna outline a couple of resources that you can check out if you're thinking about it. One really great tip that I received that I think is very, very good um, is to set aside as a business owner one to two hours a week to dream big and think of some of these things. Um, you know, whether that's just, you know, you take a walk or you sit down in front of your computer and you think about what you might, what are the big picture things you want to accomplish or big dreams that you have. Um, and it can help you set aside some time to work on the Lean Business Canvas or on other things or to just have that business plan in front of you so that it isn't just left in a dusty old drawer um, and not getting used. So one of the most important things is building your value proposition. And this is kind of a key thing that helps to identify some of the values and some of the things that you are good at. Um, so who do I serve? Uh, one of the, you know, so we talked about uh, one example would be I serve adult amateur riders who want to ride on the, um, on the A circuit in Ontario. Uh, or I serve um, trail riders who want to come out and have a good time at the barn. And what problem do I help them solve? And what do I help them do? Um, so this can be very, very different. You know, when you when I talk to a lot of people and they say, well, I mean, I don't know what I'm, what makes me different from any other boarding facility. You do have unique things that made your, made your folks choose you over other people. So um, what is it that you help them solve? Do you create a nice community space where they feel comfortable to learn? Um, do you provide a place where they can um, have a break from their, from their kids or from, the, from their stressful professional jobs? Um, what is it that you help your customers, your customers do and the problems that you help them solve? And then what is it that I do that helps them to do that? So is it through, you know, exceptional coaching? Is it through um, building community? Um, what, what might you do to do, to do that? Um, so here are a couple of, uh, here are a couple of templates that you can use. So we help X group achieve whatever um, by bringing this unique value to the, to the situation. Um, once you have this down and you've looked at kind of your big values and what you would like to achieve for your business, um, it gets a lot easier to see different ways to bring income into your business um, if you're very, very clear on these things. Um, so, you know, whether if you're, if you're a place that brings um, community and brings people together, um, potentially during the pandemic, you would have chosen to do things like, oh, we'll have a We'll have a we'll have a trivia night for our for our customers because they are you know that helps to bring them together and still feel value and still still feel like they are in that community and helps to bring them in closer to us um, and still solve their problems. I just wanted to, I know I'm, I know we only have to, I only have ten minutes to speak so um, I do want to highlight that there are also a ton of resources that are available for small business practitioners small business owners. And there's lots of people who are willing to help you. Um, I recently got involved with Innovation Guelph, which is um, which is a, an innovator, um, an incubator place in Guelph that has a ton of resources and people who are willing to help small businesses. Um, and there are and they're all over the place. This um, these three that are here, SBA.gov and BDC.ca, they have really nice resources for templates. And then there's some videos that go along with it to help to translate some of the jargon that that business folk use into regular people speak. And then Strategizer is also a nice company as well that does a very good job of bringing together some some asking you the right questions so that you can help to fill in your to fill in your business plan appropriately and get to the heart of what it is that you do and how you serve your customers. And then if you're looking for funding and support, um, and if you own a business and you're in the equine sector, you should be looking for grants and ways to get free money as well as, um, as, well as help and resources. Um, so local innovation centers are all over Ontario. There's likely one in, um, in any major city that you can think of. Also, most colleges and universities have incubator programs, and I have listed some of those here as well in the um, in some of the in the funding and support areas. 
And then colleges and university programs, their business programs will often do consults at a very, very low rate. And you can get really, really good information if you need market research or if you need them to look into other options for you. That's a great project for them. It brings them a lot of value and it also brings you a lot of value at a very, very reasonable cost. Um, a couple other ones that might be of interest to you, there's the Mon there is Ontario um, funding for those under 30 years old. There's Futurepreneur, which is the Royal Bank of Canada program for those under 40. Um, there's also a ton of federal grants for entrepreneurs and small business owners, particularly if you are a female-owned business um, or if you um, or if you're new to Canada or if you have any other any uh, there's uh, other barriers to entry that are there, but also just for any small business. So those might be things to check out. So even if you don't think of yourself as an entrepreneur, if you own a business and you're trying to be innovative and you're trying to um, trying to get clear on what you do then you're an entrepreneur and you should treat yourself as such and make sure that you are investing in um, investing in time to think about your big picture goals and how you can serve your customers better because it does help to recession proof yourself and help you to pivot and change what you're doing um, during challenging times like we've seen this year. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Barham. And we're going to open the floor up to the participants who have any questions. Um, what is your biggest suggestion on how to put your business plans into action? Oh, good question. Um, yeah, so as opposed to it being dusty in a drawer somewhere. So one, I like to keep it, that's why I think the Lean Business Canvas is nice because even if you have a formal business plan, having the Lean Canvas is a one pager you can keep keep laying around and you can keep checking on it. Um, so one of the things that I like to do, just like any other goal, if you're part of the equestrian industry, you know about goal setting and you know about how to get things done. Um, so, you know, set a, set a goal for when you'd like to have it happen. Um, think about the interim steps that might need to happen in there. And then the other thing that I'd love to do is have a, an accountability buddy. Um, so whether that's another business owner or a colleague that you know, or whether you choose an advisor or somebody within one of these incubator programs or another advisor that you trust to help keep you accountable, even if it's just to say, hey, you know, how are you doing? How are you doing there, Melanie? Are you, did you, you know, did you do what you said you were going to do this week? Um, and then setting aside that time to um, to try to put that into action, even if sometimes it gets written over, um, trying to keep that as a sacred time for yourself, whether that's, you know, Wednesday morning at 10. Um, I've heard of businesses, you know, they always, they take their team out for lunch on a Monday when then the clients are there and they have big picture talks. So those might, those are some suggestions that I've heard working in the equine industry specifically. Another question. Do you continually update your business plan? For example, adjusting to changing environments. A, a VP from last year would look very different uh, than now, for example. Do you keep copies of archived business plans? Yeah, um, so yes, your business plan is gonna change with you. Some of the things that are core to you about who you serve and who you, what you really value are going to be the same. So for example, if I really value community um, and bringing people together, that's always gonna come through in my business plan, um, but it might look a little different. So for example, I might change my, bus my business a little bit. Um, you know, if I, ran a, if I ran an equine camping ground, for example, I might change my business during COVID um, to, offer, to offer completely different things. Um, so that would change my business plan, um, but it wouldn't change the core values that, at, at the heart of it. And yeah, I think that there's nothing wrong with keeping, in a, keeping the old ones and looking back on them. Um, and that might be, that's a really strong thing as you reflect and grow and learn, like here, what did, why did I change that? What, made, what makes it different now? What did I learn in, the, in those processes? So yeah, I think those are very important things to, to try to do. Thank you again, Dr. Barham, for that terrific presentation. Uh, before we hear from our next speaker, I'd like to mention that the Equine Industry Symposium has chosen to support For the Herd, an emergency fundraiser that assists riding schools in Ontario that are struggling to provide for their horses during the pandemic. To find out more information or to donate, uh, go to www.fortheherd.ca. Uh, we would also like to mention that with every donation you make, another ticket will be entered in your name into the raffle. More information on our raffle will be mentioned later this evening. On that note, I would like to present Dr. Barham with a certificate indicating a donation made in her name 
to For the Herd as a thank you for her time. Oh, wow, uh, I will thank now, you. Oh, of course. I will now pass it over to my colleague, Chloe, to introduce our next speaker, Sean Jones. Sean Jones is an advisor with Sun Life and an avid equestrian. Sean works closely with his clients to understand their financial goals, immediate needs, and develop future financial plans. This includes advising and educating clients on all aspects of financial planning, owning a home, starting a family, education planning, managing careers, and preparing for retirement. Lending his expertise to the equestrian industry, Sean is providing resources and education in collaboration with industry associations to businesses and individuals that are looking to develop a financial plan, have questions about finances, and are, are seeking the proper financial support for their business. Combining his financial expertise and passion for the equestrian industry, Sean has partnered with For the Herd Fundraiser to provide direct support to individuals and equestrian businesses seeking financial guidance. Sean will be speaking with us today about the financial component of the business and the implementation of contingency plans. Hello, and thanks for joining me. Uh, thank you, Dr. Barham. What a wonderful uh, segue into what I'm going to talk about. Um, I love talking about business planning, so I'd love to talk to you more about all that stuff because uh, that correlates a lot with what I do. Tonight, I'm speaking to facility operators, the barn owners, the trainers, any people that rely on the horse business to put food on their tables. If you're not in either of those categories, that's fine, and I'm thrilled to have you here. Okay. I don't have a lot of time to discuss my credentials here, so you're going to have to trust me on this, but please check out the Equine Guelph Horse Portal for our Financial Future Series uh, webinars. Uh, a lot of the content that I'm going to talk about today is going to be in there. Um, I will say this, though. I am a planner by nature and by profession. There's a piece of paper on my wall that says I'm an expert in helping people plan for worst case scenarios, but not a single textbook taught anybody about a global pandemic that was going to shut down our businesses for months. So we were all, you know, absolutely blindsided by this pandemic. The good thing is that we had a chance to reopen. The problem is now that cases are on the rise, we may need to be prepared for another possible shutdown. Now, I'm not chicken little. I'm not here to yell uh, the sky is falling. I'm an optimist by nature. Most horse people are. All I'm saying is, wouldn't you sleep better at night if you had a plan in place and you were a little more prepared. So look, we've been experiencing unprecedented times right now, particularly for this industry. You were the first people I thought about when this pandemic hit. I was you at one point in my life. I quickly imagined how my business would have been impacted by this pandemic. What would I have done? Well, let's understand that this is a self-directed problem to solve. Without Ontario Equestrian and, and Equine Canada and, and Equine Guelph, there's not a lot of resources out there to help you. So we've got to be, we've got to kind of help each other out a little bit. For being honest, your business was born out of capitalism. Whether you agree with it or not, there are not a lot of social safety nets in place to protect you like there are for other industries. And most of you started from scratch with nothing but an absolutely pure and unbridled passion for the love of horses. As that passion evolved, you built something truly special in the business that you pour your heart and your soul into. And now that business is being threatened by a force completely out of our control. Look, this pandemic's created a lot of anxiety for a lot of people. And my hope is that we can all kind of come together and have the capacity to take a deep breath and reevaluate our purpose, our mission, and some of our processes. Now I can help you with the processes, but it's up to you to determine and maybe remind yourself of your purpose and your mission. So how to come out of this pandemic better than you went in and how do we make 2021 the best year ever, okay? Well, it's gonna take some discipline. Here we are, we're in November already. So I need you on the rail, drop your irons. It's no stir up November. Think of me and any other member of the financial professional community as your financial trainer, just like your horse trainer, just like your riding trainer. We know that sugarcoating everything and making things easy is not what's in your best interests. Just like riding with no stirrups, it's gonna secure your base of support. Understanding the basic financial fundamentals is gonna secure your financial base of support. But look, it's freaking hard. This is gonna require some major discipline, some pain, and it's gonna hurt. Trust me, when you're in your 40s and you try and go do no stirrups, it ain't comfortable. First, a little dose of reality. You've all heard this before. I remember hearing this as a kid. 
A horse professional rarely looks at wealth building in a traditional sense. We've been conditioned to think, do what you love and the money will follow. And that sounds romantic, but it's wrong. We have to stop playing the starving artist. Money will not follow. You need to put a halter on that thing. You need to put a lip chain on it and pull that rogue with all your might. You might need someone behind it with a lunge whip. Look, it's, I, it's not an easy task to understand. We've, we grew this thing with passion, but now we've got to think about it from a profitability standpoint. So let's segue now into, let's assess your readiness for another crisis. So five considerations for you to determine whether you're a spectator or a participant in the next crisis. And look, under normal circumstances, being a participant is more favorable than being a spectator, especially for us control-free horse folks. But in this case, I would rather be a spectator. So let's go through these five considerations. One, do you have a revenue, do you have revenue streams in addition to your lesson income? Boarding and training can make up a big part for this. So for boarding and training barns, maybe that don't necessarily just rely on lesson income, this may have been a well-deserved vacation. Two, are all your horses generating, generating 2x their expenses? This is an important uh, concept that I went over in, in some of the, uh, the webinars that we did, where we talked about your horse, this horse costs X to maintain each month, it needs to generate 2X for uh, this to be sustainable. Three, have you eliminated all unnecessary expenses? Okay, you can do um, a cash flow analysis. I have an Excel spreadsheet that I can send you on request. Um, this will help with this process. But really, I mean, do you have schoolies that are in, the, in aluminum shoes, you know, eating high-end textured feed or oral supplements? Maybe we need to reevaluate that, right? Four, do you have a theory or do you have theory that you can teach virtually and potentially monetize? Maybe even just from a, from a value add standpoint. A friend of mine in the States who's also a brilliant Grand Prix jumper rider uh, is right in the process of reading this book. And I've, I own the book as well. It's 101 exercises for training jumpers. I used it a lot when I was training, but, but she took it another step further. She she rides each exercise or one exercise per day um, and puts it on Facebook for her clients to see. Uh, if you were to take one of your clients' horses and do this, I mean, that would be such a huge value add. It, your client would see you doing something on Smokey going, wow, I never knew Smokey could do that. And you could respond, well, that's why you pay me the big bucks. Five, this is daunting. Do you have enough cash in your emergency fund to cover expenses for three to six months of zero revenue? I recommend to all my non-horsey clients, this is a priority, right? So it's easier for the average Canadian to do this. I get it. Us horse people, we have higher expenses, right? This is a daunting task, but with help, we can get you there. Make this a priority. So we need to understand why you're in business aside from the whole passion thing and the, and the whole loving of horses thing. According to the, the Bureau of Labor and Statistics, 70% of businesses fail in the first 10 years. That means that for every 10 of you listening to this right now, only three of you will be in business 10 years from now. I think I've kind of figured out why. Based on this, on this website, why go into business for yourself? The top responses, the top four responses were to do my own thing, control my own destiny. I don't want to work for someone else to better utilize my skills and ability. And four, we finally get to money, to make money. You can see why seven out of 10 businesses fail. This list is upside down. It's impossible to do the first three unless you are accomplishing the fourth. We have to change the mindset that money and profit are a consequence or byproduct of your operation. Now look, I'm not telling you to instantaneously turn yourself into Scrooge McDuck, but we have to start making profit a priority again, like every other successful business. Profit is not a bad word. So how do we build longevity and stability into your business plan? So five steps that dramatically improve your financial base of support, just like riding with no stirrups. First of all, you've heard this before, pay yourself first. 15% used to be 10, interest rates are super low right now. We've got to save more, 
okay? We tend to pay our horses first. That model doesn't work from a fiscally responsible standpoint, okay? Imagine you're on a plane, right? And the oxygen masks fall. They tell you to put your mask on first before you put your child's mask on. Your horses need you to be able to breathe first. Pay yourself first, pay your, pay your horses after. Second, pay off all your debt except your mortgage using the debt snowball. I don't have a lot of time. I can't get into the debt snowball right now, but if you ask me, I'll tell you all the details all about it. It is also on the horse portal. Um, this is important. I like to look at, I put a guide on this. It says, if it can't be paid off in 24 months, I sell it. Get the business operating on a minimum 25% margin. It seems like a no brainer, but it's difficult in the horse business. I get it. I want you to increase revenue, decrease costs, and make sure every horse is profitable. Get to that 25% number. Four, 10% allocated for future business growth. This is not fixing the fence in the fifth paddock. This is, if I build more stalls, I can get more borders. If I hire an instructor, I can, get, I can teach more lessons. This is revenue growth initiatives. Five, consult an accountant to consider incorporating. Maybe you're in a position where your marginal tax rate is increasing. Maybe you're in a position where we can keep money in the corporation, which is highly tax favorable. What if every dollar you brought in created an opportunity in the future rather than fulfilling an obligation of the past? I wanna talk about that from a matter of, we need to eliminate debt as fast as possible so we can grow and grow and grow. Okay, I'm gonna quickly go through this. I needed to throw the Griffin in there just because I used to go to Guelph and I love the Griffin. But anyways, the best advantage you have in any realm is to seize the opportunity to learn more and faster than your competition. Okay, I used to tell this to my students. The quickest learner was usually the best show ring rider. Just by attending this symposium, you're giving yourself an advantage. Now, this, am, this all may seem a little overwhelming and I get it. The proper financial planning is a one step at a time process. Small steps lead to big changes. Make realistic attainable goals. Put the cookies on the shelf so you can reach them, right? You can accomplish this. And again, seek out advisors that can help you. I'll leave you with this one final thought. I brought this up in one of the webinar series. You guys are awesome. I love hanging out with worse people. You're my favorite people on the planet. You work harder than most. You're more honest and trustworthy. You have the heart of a caregiver. You need to understand just how much you are worth. And I'm seriously concerned that you are undervaluating yourselves as professionals. You're not charging enough for your services. Like it or not, what you charge is a reflection of your own self-value. I need you to charge more so you can generate more revenue so I can tell you what to do with that revenue. Here's an example. I took my kids go-karting in the summer. It was $27 for 10 minutes. That's $162 an hour to ride a glorified lawnmower that doesn't poop, that doesn't eat, that doesn't have expensive shoes. Let's put that into context into what you are charging. Thanks for listening. Feel free to reach out to me with any questions. Um, and be sure to check out the Financial Futures webinar series on the Equine Wealth Portal. So I guess I'll take some questions now. Yes, thank you very much, Mr. Jones. Um, so we have a few questions here. For business owners, how uh, can they financially prepare and be proactive for the second wave of COVID-19 to ensure survival? Oh, yeah, I mean, I tried to cover some of that in the very limited time that I have and, and I, I didn't do the topic justice and I apologize, but yes, there are a lot of things you can do. Uh, the first thing is, and the priority would be build up that emergency fund. Go through an exercise. And again, if you like, email me. I can send you an Excel spreadsheet. Let's itemize all your expenses and let's create uh, an idea or a, a 30,000 foot view on what it costs to operate my facility um, down to the penny. And let's do everything we can to just stash and hoard cash. You know, we're not investing this. We're not putting this anywhere. We're just hoarding cash as if we're doing it under the mattress. Uh, this is the rainy day fund. Um, that should be priority one, is build up that three to six months worth of, of emergency fund. 
uh, worth of expenses. And I said, like I said, it's a daunting task and we may not have a whole lot of time to do it because like I said, cases are rising. Um, but I would stop doing everything. Stop investing, uh, stop building, stop growing, start throwing money into a money market fund or cash under the mattress or a jar on the fridge, whatever. Um, just start hoarding cash. That's priority one. Priority two would be, uh, let's start attacking some debt, right? Get out of debt as, as fast as possible. Um, and, and, and then now start creating um, some revenue streams that don't involve clients coming to your facility because that we may get to a shutdown uh, environment again. Um, so how do we monetize our ability to uh, create a dialogue and connect with our clients without having to physically be there with them? Um, it sounds like Dr. Barham might have a lot of insight on that with regards to her business planning as well. I think she'd be a good resource there too. Thank you. We have uh, one more question. Um, there is concern on how do you care for the uh, value of the animal without diminishing their welfare? So I believe what they were trying to ask is how do you uh, decrease their expenses without um, taking care of their welfare properly? Um, I mean, I mean, we've got an amazing resource with Equine Guelph to to find out, uh, you know, the, the best um, strategies for for feed and nutrition. Um, talk to your professionals. Talk to your veterinarian. I mean, we all, as as horse people, we have great relationships with our vets and our farriers and the feed store. And 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 look, I mean, there's got to be a, a a feed that's uh, that's good that you that's affordable right, to feed the, the non-high revenue generating horses. But the fact of the matter is you cannot compromise welfare and safety of a horse, it, it, you just can't. Um, but if it gets to a point where um, I can't affordably maintain this horse in my program, um, you know, the big barns have this concept down packed. If it doesn't fit into the program, if, we, if it doesn't uh, generate the revenue that's designed to fit in this model, um, it has the horse has to be sold, even if it's at a loss. If it can't be sold, I have a network of farms that I know that maybe I can donate the horse and they can use it. Um, and, and look, I, I know these we love these animals and we don't want to get rid of them. That's the last thing we want to do at the time. Um, but we also have to be uh, mindful of the monetary impact on the business, right? Um, Again, you can never compromise the health and the welfare of the animal, but there are affordable ways to do it. Use your network of resources uh, in the community and, you know, let's do some brainstorming and figure out how we can get the cost down uh, on some of these animals, right? Amazing. Thank you very much. And uh, Emma, I'll pass it to you. Uh, thank you, Sean, for that engaging and inspirational presentation. Uh, we would like to present you with a certificate indicating a donation made in your name to For the Herd as a thank you for your time. Uh, before we move into our last presentation of the evening, I have a PSA for any Equestrian Canada certified coaches joining us today. By attending the symposium, you can claim updating hours for the maintenance of your certification. Information on where to find and submit the form should be presented on the screen as we speak and can also be found on our Facebook and Instagram pages. I would like to now ask my colleague, Kyla, who's been helping us with the Q and A's, to introduce our final speakers of the evening who've sent a pre-recorded version of their presentation but will be joining us for a live Q and A, uh, Mike King and Catherine Wilson. Uh, Mike King is a partner and in national equine industry lead at the general insurance brokerage of Capri CMW Insurance Services, working from his office in Aurora, Ontario. For the past 27 years, Mike's insurance career has focused on the delivery of insurance products and services designed for the equine community, and with his team of specialists, is currently in service of hundreds of associations and tens of thousands of individuals representing every discipline and facet of the horse industry across Canada. In addition to his work as a broker, Mike participates as a guest instructor several times a year 
at the University of Guelph to share his insight with an international student body and is a proud and is proud to be a longstanding education patron and supporter of Equine Guelph. Catherine Wilson has been a leading practitioner in the construction, employment, and equine legal fields for over 25 years. She is an industry member of Ontario Equestrian and was a member of the International Equine and Animal Lawyers Association. She is an honorary governor at the Royal Agricultural Winter Fair, chair of the Risk Management Committee, and a former member of the Finance Committee at the Royal Agricultural Winter Fair. Catherine publishes extensively in the Horse Sport Magazine on issues of equine law and is currently writing a book on legal issues related to the horse industry. As well, she has given conferences and webinars across Canada on equine law for several organizations. It is an honor to welcome Mike King and Catherine Wilson. So let's get into the questions right away here. Uh, the first question, and we'll start with Catherine. Uh, the question is, can I be sued if someone alleges that they contracted COVID-19 at my barn, my show, my clinic, et cetera? Okay, so the answer is yes, you can be sued. You can be sued often and for many, many things. The question is, can they be successful in the lawsuit? For them to be successful in the lawsuit relating to a COVID-19 contraction, number one, they would have to show that they contracted COVID-19 at your barn or your show or your clinic. And that's difficult to show. How do you show that you got it there and not on the ride home or not on the bus or not getting groceries? But that's number one. They'd have to show on a balance of probabilities, more likely than not, they contracted COVID at your stable. Number two, they'd have to show that you were not following appropriate protocols. Were you doing everything that you were legislated to do in terms of protecting people from COVID-19? Were you doing everything that it is reasonable to do to protect people from COVID-19? Were you enforcing the mask rules? Were you socially distancing? Were you wiping things down? In a horse stable, I think it's a little harder to wipe things down than it might be in a restaurant. So some of this stuff is subject to interpretation, but the two things are one, they'd have to prove, or at least on a balance of probabilities, prove they got it at your barn. And two, they'd have to show that you were almost negligent in some way, not enforcing the appropriate protocols, which change, it appears from week to week and month to month and in different parts of the country. Uh, there are some uh, there well, long-term care homes in Ontario, at least there's been a statute passed or legislation passed that limit liability uh, in lawsuits for long-term care homes. There's been class actions launched against all the long-term care homes. The Ontario government has passed legislation that says uh, you can't sue a long-term care home unless they did something really, really bad, not in keeping with the proper safety protocols that all long-term care homes should have used during this time. So we don't have that in the horse industry and it's only so far in that industry that that legislation is passed. Michael? Okay, so so to add to Catherine's comments, and, and, and I, should, I should preface this by saying that throughout these last several months, Catherine and I have both had hundreds of phone calls from facility managers and herd managers and, and coaches and, and other professionals in the horse industry about this very topic. Because everyone's quite afraid, uh, afraid and, and anxious about the, the probability of being sued or being uh, held legally accountable for something that they can't see, uh, they can't smell, it's really difficult to identify a, a surface that might be contaminated. So, so to Catherine's point, it's, 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 we're challenged in the industry in a very new environment with a lot of variables that vary from barn to barn. Um, to Catherine's point, wiping down surfaces inside a barn versus outside a barn, uh, wiping down school tack, is that practical, is it possible? Can you show that you've done what is reasonable and how do you do that? And we're gonna talk about a few of those things a, a little later in the short presentation. But what I wanna speak about this, this moment, and, and it's sort of a, 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 a spoil alert, um, unfortunately what's happened, because this is such an unknown environment globally, and, and governments and, and officials, health officials are still trying, are still struggling to try and figure out how to manage this and, and, and squelch it. The insurance industry being as they are, have withdrawn coverage on COVID. 
So as much as there may be legislation uh, in some jurisdictions, as Catherine alluded to, uh, that may uh, impact some businesses uh, or protect some businesses or some individuals to a point in certain circumstances, regrettably, there is no backstop of an insurance policy for COVID-19 related issues. Pandemic and, and uh, uh, sickness are, are, are not things that the insurance industry is simply is prepared to, to backstop. Uh, it would be impractical and, and, and frankly quite unfair for insurers to be burdened with that financial responsibility of holding up society um, in the absence of government assistance or what have we. So the insurers have frankly all withdrawn. Uh, so uh, policyholders that are watching this, uh, this uh, video, I promise you on your renewal, if not already, uh, there will be a big fat note uh, on the face of the policy or somewhere buried in the wording that COVID-19 or pandemic or uh, uh, communicable disease is now an excluded uh, loss and there is no coverage provided for you. So, th and that's, an, so that's an important distinction. Um, the um, permanent contraction, of course, is the big issue, as Catherine alluded to. How do you prove that? Uh, there's so many variables. Just coming here to the office today, there was probably five different points of potential contact of, of COVID-19 just for me. Um, and gosh knows, I think I'm healthy, but th there's just so many things that we can't control. So that's all I have to say on that. Perfect. Thanks, Mike. Um, so the next question we have here, and, and we'll start with Mike on this one, is how can I mitigate the risks associated with COVID-19 in my business, especially without insurance coverage? What about WSIB? Uh, what strategies can I employ? Okay, and, and I'll let Catherine speak to the WSIB piece in a second, but, but one of the things that, that, that we have learned as insurance professionals over, over time is the use of, of acknowledgement of risk forms or, or waivers, as they're often referred to. We prefer the term acknowledgement of risk forms. Um, and, and those forms, uh, which have been frankly widely used in the horse industry to discuss things uh, that are inherent in the activity, just that proximity, that interaction with a thousand pound animal, uh, that are fairly well understood by most folks, um, have now been expanded and modified to embrace this new risk uh, of pandemic or uh, communicable disease. So the language on, on most of those forms has changed. Certainly the insurers we represent that provide liability insurance who do use forms or impose the use of those forms as part of their policy conditions have amended wording very specifically related to communicable disease. And our hope now, as always is the case, when, when uh, folks, professionals are using these forms in their communication with their customers, that they're using the forms as a tool, not as, an, as, a, as a single tool, but as a part of a risk management strategy that allows for them to have a meaningful conversation with their client, with their customer, to say, look, there are risks associated with being on my property. There are risks associated with riding my school horse. Those risks include some of the obvious things about being in, in, in proximity to a big, big animal, but now we've got to discuss this broader environmental risk of communicable disease. I've done everything that I can to protect you as a, as a professional, as a service provider, but I need you to sign this form saying you understand that even though I've done just everything I can, that there's still a possibility, a risk that you could contract this, this disease uh, here at my site. And you've got to tell me that you're okay and you're not going to sue me. Several law firms across the country have, have come up with very specific forms. They've come up with facility forms that are used on a regular basis. They come up with daily attestation forms, which by their, as their name would imply, the daily recording of, uh, of, of a form that, that um, uh, they're using. Uh, we've got uh, event specific forms now that are floating around the industry. And, and again, I'll, I'll defer to Catherine, but it, it suffice to say that until such time as the courts have ruled upon several circumstances or circumstances re uh, uh, relating, uh, relating to these, these forms or the COVID-19 situation. It's very difficult for anyone to make certain that the, the wording that they're using is going to be airtight because that's simply not the case. The use of forms is a big deal. Catherine and I were speaking yesterday before we talked about this. And I'll say this quickly, Catherine, so we get to the WSIB because that's important. But the use of signage, you know, is that a reasonable strategy to try and help people be warned about the inherent risks about being on the property? And I think personally it is. I think that if I was standing beside a defendant in court and, and they were being asked about what they had done to protect their cu customers. The use of signage certainly can, in my opinion anyway, uh, would be a reasonable part of a risk management strategy. Asking those questions that we're all asked every time we go out into a store, 
Have you traveled in the last 14 days? Do you have the sniffles? Have you been around anybody that's got the disease? All those sort of obvious questions that we're becoming very used to. And, and frankly, if the sign's prominently displayed, again, it's part of a defense strategy. And that's really what we're speaking to. So I'll stop. Over to you, Catherine. All right, so a big takeaway there is get your boarders and guests to sign waivers, okay? We've always said that. Now your waiver is going to include this extra paragraph about COVID and communicable diseases. If you have a waiver signed, it's a big help. We can't promise you're not gonna get sued. We can't promise it won't be successful, but we can tell you it'll be a lot easier to defend an action if you have the waiver versus not having the waiver. Um, in terms of what you need to do when people come into your barn, in Ontario at least, the Ontario government introduced a COVID-19 screening tool for workplaces as of September 26 of this year, which includes a minimum set of questions that must be asked by employers to employees and essential visitors. So that would be, your, I guess, your boarders or people who are coming that are essential to see the horses. Each day, each day they come to work, which includes whether the employee or essential worker has symptoms or signs of COVID, you know, the five or six or seven symptoms, um, you know, whether they've traveled outside of Canada in the last 14 days, whether they've come into close contact with a confirmed or probable case of COVID, the same questions you're asked every time you go to your massage therapist or you go to your doctor or your dentist, you have to be asking them in your horse barn. And that can be part of the waiver. I mean, in, in many places, every time you walk in, there's a piece of paper, you go check, 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 and you sign it on the bottom and you date it and they put it in the file because those should be kept so that if there is an incidence of COVID in your barn, you can pull it out and say, everybody answered the questionnaire and the answer was no. If you don't do this, there are fines and charges. So it's punishable, it's legislation and it's punishable with charges and fines. So make sure that people coming in, fill out that questionnaire and you can have the waiver as part of that. You could have even a separate you know, COVID waiver or you can do as Mike does and you put it in the full thing and have them sign it. Cause from now on, future, that's the future. It's gonna be in every waiver, but you could have this separate questionnaire with the COVID waiver that everybody signs every time they come. Do they have to sign it every time they come? That's basically what the legislation says. Is everybody doing that? Not everybody, I'm gonna leave that to you, but the legislation says every time, and then you put it in a folder. Okay, so that's that part. In terms of your employees, uh, the health and safety of workers is a top concern during the COVID-19 outbreak. Employers have the duty to keep workers and workplaces safe and free of hazards, and workers have the right to refuse unsafe work. So if people are coming to your barn, workers, and are, they're feeling unsafe, they don't think your protocols are sufficient, they can complain to the Ministry of Labor and have it examined and they have a right to refuse work. This is under the, um, again, this is Ontario, but uh, it's legislated and it's the Ontario Health and Safety Act. And uh, let's move to the WSIB. So that's workers you know, the, the uh, compensation program we have for employees to help employees when they're injured in the workplace. A worker is entitled to benefits for COVID-19 arising out of and in the course of the worker's employment. So that's interesting. They're adjudicated on a case-by-case -case basis. And in all cases, the merits are looked at and then they decide, what are they looking for? The test right now for a worker to claim COVID-19 benefits through the WSIB are one, the nature of the worker's employment created a risk of contracting the disease to which the public at large is not normally exposed. And two, the WSIB is satisfied that the worker's COVID-19 condition has been confirmed. That probably means a test or it could mean symptoms, but it's one and two. So basically you need persuasive evidence that the worker's employment made a significant contribution to the worker's illness. Now question whether your workplace is a workplace that creates a risk of contracting the disease to which the public at large is not normally exposed. Riding a horse around an arena? I don't know. Riding outside? Probably not. Grooming in a, you know, in a, in grooming in a, in a confined stable area? That might be more questionable, but these are the tests that the WSIB will be looking at 
um, to give your worker who is ill with COVID-19 uh, benefits. Now, can you get WSIB? Should you have WSIB? Uh, Mike and I have been on this for a long, long time. I'm not going to say how many years, but a long, long time. Long saying, time. Long time. Saying, yes, your barns need WSIB insurance. Your workers should be employees, not contractors, and you should enroll in WSIB. Can you enroll? WSIB is mandatory for crop and livestock farming. Uh, cattle raising and grain growing. It's, it's mandatory for racehorse breeding and racing, saddle horse breeding and racing, workhorse breeding and racing, horse ranching, pony farming. It is optional for business activities which include operating horseback riding facilities, horseback riding schools, boarding stables, and those engaged in horse training, including race horse training. That's optional. You will find these on the website of WSIB. Many of you are probably in the mandatory category. If you're in the optional category, please get WSIB because if a worker is injured, uh, it will protect you from losing your home and your property, and it'll protect the worker. Um, Michael, anything else? No, I just, I, I, I want to stress in 12 seconds or less how important that WSIB piece is. And what people often forget, and Catherine, please correct me if I'm wrong, but even a sole proprietor as a registered business can enroll in WSIB if they're self-employed. Yes. And that's an important distinction in our, in our industry so that those that count themselves as being sole proprietors can still receive the benefits associated with WSIB. The last time I looked in Ontario, and I appreciate we've got an audience that's much broader than Ontario, but here at home, the WSIB rating for the optional category is $7.09 per hundred of wage paid. That's the premium. So that's the cost associated with obtaining and receiving the benefit uh, associated with WSIB. And let's remember folks, that's your tax dollars at work. You're not giving it to some corporation. Uh, WSIB operates uh, solely for the benefit of workers. And uh, uh, as Catherine alluded to, we have been advocates for people, to please become enrolled have that relationship between employer and employee as you should in, in, in our industry. It elevates you, it protects your worker, it protects yourself. It's just the right thing to do. So enough about that. Okay, Chris. Okay, thanks. Yeah, um, so the next question, and we just have uh, a few minutes for this one, but uh, how do I manage COVID-19 in other areas of my business, including horse welfare and border customer relationships? We'll start with Mike on this one. Okay, and I will be brief, Chris, because there are other speakers during the course of this week-long symposium that are going to speak very specifically to the horse welfare issues and, and, and so forth. There's some very qualified veterinarians and others that are speaking, so I'll encourage anyone who's watching us, Catherine and I, tonight to, to look for those opportunities to hear speakers that are very specific, experts in that field. But what I will say, when, I talk, when, when the question comes about engagement and, and how does the business survive when the customers can't come to the barn as often as they were, or the services that I've typically provided aren't able to be provided. Um, how do I keep that engagement? And frankly, over these last seven or eight months, again, taking hundreds of calls from hundreds of coaches, I've learned so much about the professionalism and the creativity of coaches who have found ways through Zoom type presentations, speaking to their clients, speaking to their clients over, over Zoom about the athleticism that's necessary to be a good rider, and focusing on things that the rider and the coach can work on, uh, stretching exercises, strengthening exercises, all those things that are so important to be safe in the saddle, um, as well as using their equine knowledge and speaking to things about the specifics of a boarder or, or an owner's horse and saying, look, we know this horse is stiff on his left side, so what we're gonna do because you can't get here to ride as often is we're gonna focus on those things, but I wanna share with you what I know about the physiology of your horse and how I can improve it. Those are all chargeable services by the provider, in my opinion, and are legitimate. Uh, so uh, I, I'm, I'm hopeful that over time, as COVID continues to ebb and flow, uh, and be perhaps before we get out the other end, the coaches will realize that they have a lot more to offer their customers than simply sit up straight and put your heels down, uh, figuratively speaking, and, and that they, they have these, these vast depths of knowledge that they can and should be sharing uh, with their customers to continue engagement because those engagement relationships will serve them well on the other side, as it were. So, so I'll stop talking about, uh, about that. And, and, and Catherine, what can you speak to on the horse welfare side? 
Okay, so on the so a bunch of calls that I'm getting are oh, my horse is injured. I wasn't there. It's COVID nineteen. I haven't been allowed to the barn, and my horse is injured. So a lot of boarders are in the dark. They're worried about their horses, and and something's happened, and it's a question of trust. And these are difficult questions. Um, a concern I raised with Michael is, in the short term, the answer was uh, these barns are locked down. You're locked down. You don't go to the barn unless you are delivering an essential service to the animal that is not being delivered by the barn. And an essential service doesn't mean riding your animal three times a week because it needs its exercise. Okay, an essential service might be a, a veterinarian and veterinary issue that you own only you are dealing with or, or some maybe they're not mucking out and you need to go and feed and water the horse. There's an essential service, but minimum standard of care essential services was the rule. March, April, May. A question I have now, now that we're into the second wave, and it could be a prolonged wave, is, is what does it mean for the horse industry now? Is it still minimum care? And if so, for how long? And I think the industry has become and is going to continue to become creative in how do we manage these horses? Because it's not like a car you can leave in a garage, obviously, and it's gonna be the same in six months. You've got to be able to manage the welfare of the horses. Perhaps we have to try to raise the bar from a minimum a little higher so that the owners are happy, you're happy, and you are still obeying the protocols and being as safe as you can. I don't have an answer as to how, but it's, I think this is going to be prolonged, and I think we have to find a way. Michael? No, I got nothing else to offer, Catherine. I think that's great advice. Um, you know, you can, you. Videos, yeah. you can use videos, you can use videos, you can use, oh, one other thing, boarding agreements. From now on, and this is a bit into the future, let's try moving forward, just like we're doing with the waivers, to figure out some protocols. So if this ever happens again, God forbid, we have those protocols in place in our contracts with our boarders and with our riders. So we don't have to do this on the fly and have everybody upset, but we know what's going to happen and we've all agreed to it ahead of time. So what you're talking to, Catherine, just to be clear, is, is accessibility of the animal by the borders. Yes. Accessibility right. of the animal, yes. And, and, yes. and yes. Yeah. And what constitutes essential care. Thank you. Yes. And what they're paying for. Yes. But all those things. But those are, those are the legitimate things, right? Okay. Okay. Uh, thank you. So next question. Um, is there legislation that affects me as an employer, as a business operator, as an owner of a property in the presence of a pandemic? Uh, Catherine, we'll start with you. Um, there's lots of legislation, as in Ontario at least, and all throughout throughout Canada, the provinces are coming down with new legislation every month. Legislation dealing with employment, legislation dealing with payments for businesses, legislation serve, you know, federal legislation for for payment of workers, uh, limited liability legislation, as we've seen, uh, you know, Ontario Health and Safety Act legislation, WSIB. So it's fast and furious. Employment Standards Act, uh, Ontario passed the Infectious Disease Emergency Leave Act, which when you let an employee go, uh, normally it's if you're going to lay them off rather than terminate them. And if you terminate them, you have to pay them severance pay. If you lay them off, you don't have to because you're expecting them back. It was a maximum of 13 weeks in most cases. The Ontario government then extended that through statute. So it's changing all the time. Um, so the answer is yes. And uh, what do you do and how do you find out? You go to your federal websites, you go to your provincial websites, you go to your municipal websites, that's where I would start and just put in COVID and whatever you're looking at. Okay, so I would start with your government websites and then I would go into things like the, the payroll association website. Some of these larger organizations that are dealing with employees or dealing with you know sports associations you can go to the coaching association you can go these larger associations that are dealing with this every day your sport associations and see what they're saying so it's a little bit of research you're going to need internet probably or someone that has it and uh, and and then talk to your peers uh, talk to your own associations and just confirm what you're seeing and understanding to be what everyone else is doing because there's uh, power in numbers too Mm -hmm. yeah, and I and I have nothing to I have nothing to add to that. I, I really don't, Catherine. I think that's the that's the 
the thing that we both learned and that's it's, it's just about communication and trying to keep on top of what the, what the changes are that seem to be occurring by the hour if not by the day um, and as cases rise and, and, and ebb and flow as i alluded to before we're going to have to be ever aware of what's going on and you know tomorrow can i go to the gym or not i i don't know i'm going to have to check tomorrow because today i can and tomorrow i may not be able to It'll be the same thing in our industry folks we're just going to have to be nimble but frankly i have every confidence that the industry will survive this it may look a little different i've been saying this for months but i don't think there's any going back to what was i don't think that the horse industry will go back to anything i think that that's the wrong attitude to take because then you're searching for something that may or may not ever appear again I think it's more a case of being forward thinking and looking at ways that you can protect yourself, protect your business, grow your business, elevate your business, be more prominent in your community, be an activist, be, be an advocate for the industry. Uh, those are things that are going to help us all survive. Catherine and I, like all of you on this call, are, are rely and partner and whole on the horse industry for our livelihoods. So we have a vested interest just like you. And those are the ways that we're trying to manage our businesses. We're trying to look for opportunities. And frankly, I see lots of that. Uh, too long for, for, the, for the few seconds we've got left, but clearly there are opportunities that we, we can and should be taking advantage of as we look forward. And, and, and the industry will be here, guys. We're just going to have to manage it a little differently. Well, Would we you had agree, the, Catherine? Yeah, we had the Royal Agricultural Winter Fair last week. Right now, as we're taping it, it's this week, but last week, and it was virtual. And it was yeah. really interesting. It was, it was yeah. great. So, yeah. so, we can do a lot with this. Imagine all the Zoom clinics you guys can do and the money you can make and you can recycle it and recycle it and recycle it. It's not just 10 horses, it can be horses into perpetuity. So there's lots of opportunity here. Um, we just have to stay together, united, communicate. And, and I really think if anything has, this has taught us, we have to pull together as an industry. Okay. okay, thank you. So I think that answers our last question then about what the future looks like of the equine industry. I think you guys have, have answered that and we're, we're up against our time. So we'll, uh, we'll, we'll stop end this here and we'll kick it over to uh, live questions. Thank you, Mike King and Catherine Wilson. That uh, was very educational. And now we're gonna move on to a few questions that have been submitted. So first is insurance companies have a financial interest in minimizing the risk that they will be called on to pay out under insurance policies and therefore have any interest in pressing equine facility owners to take the most restrictive practices possible even if those practices harm horse welfare and imp improvise uh, facility owners uh, who in the equine system could or should act as a check against excessive pressure from insurers? Well, <clears throat> that's a very difficult question to answer, but I wanna go back to something that I said at the beginning of that pre-recorded session. And, and thank you all for being patient while Catherine and I did that. Uh, we've learned uh, in our experiences together over decades that because there's so much crossover in the topics we discuss with customers every day, it was just easier to sort of format that so we weren't tripping on each other. <clears throat> but to the, uh, the person who asked the question, I'm not sure that there's any um, inherent pressure from the insuring industry related to COVID. Um, and as I mentioned at the beginning of the, uh, the pre-recorded session, insurers have actually withdrawn coverage for COVID. Um, the expectation from insurers now, as always, is that facility managers uh, and others who invite people to their premises to receive a service uh, do so with the utmost care for the benefit of their client. In other words, they have a duty to uh, uh, make sure that people are safe. Um, that is not new. Um, uh, what has changed is not their responsibility to keep people safe, but, the, but what has changed is simply the responsibility has expanded to include this, this COVID-19 risk. Um, but again, there's no insurance policy that I'm aware of, at least uh, uh, in our experience so far, is providing coverage for COVID which means by default then that we're not imposing risk management strategies specifically to mitigate that. It's rather just um, a good community service that says we want everyone to stay safe, which is obvious to, to all. Um, and therefore we will contribute to the conversation as we can, but frankly have to defer um, uh, to health officials and government bodies to provide the guidance necessary for business operators to conduct themselves appropriately to protect citizens. That's it. 
Thank you. And another question we have is, are there specific rules for equestrian centers regarding COVID? For example, cleaning of lead ropes, halters, gates, et cetera. Okay, and, and again, I, 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 as I looked, again, we, we've spoken about this so often in these last several uh, months, and it seems to be variable, uh, municipality to municipality, province to province, region to region. The fact of the matter is that public health officials are the sole authority on what constitutes appropriate behavior for cleaning of contact services and, and um, keeping environments safe for people to visit a premises, whether it's a restaurant, a barn, or, or my office for that matter. And there is guidance on all of those things. What we said to most, uh, to everyone that has asked us this question previously is simply to create a risk management strategy that appears to be sort of logical and, and coherent. And then frankly, reach out to public health officials in the municipality to say, look, I'm a barn owner. I have people visiting my premises for these services to be provided, whether it's a boarding place or a riding school or a trail riding facility or whatever it may be. These are the things that I plan to do in my environment. Are these things uh, in accordance with and, and consistent with the guidance being provided, or excuse me, by uh, being directed by public health authorities? It's a simple yes or no answer. You're not asking for their approval because frankly, most won't approve a specific plan, but they certainly can provide guidance in a broader sense to, uh, to make sure that you're doing the things that are reasonable. And in my estimation, if you're doing those things that are reasonable, I don't, I don't know what else you can do. Uh, none of us know exactly how to do this. Um, this is all very new to everyone on the planet. So we're all just doing the best we can. There, there is some room too for uh, create creativity here. You can um, obey safety protocols and at the same time do something extra uh, to please your customers, to um, give them a little bit more. And uh, I don't know what that is. It's unique to your barn and unique to your own creativity, but uh, some businesses and some businesses are pulling ahead of others because of the things they are doing in this pandemic that is just rising above. And as a, a uh, horse stable or operation, you can do the same. Thank you. And we have uh, one more question. And that is, how long do you have to keep the COVID records for? Oh, Catherine, that's on you. Uh, uh, okay, by the way, I can't turn on my video, just so that you know, <laughs> the host, it says the host has stopped it. So you've got, you've got my name, but um, we don't know is the answer. <laughs> um, so what I would do is simply um, scan them if you've got a computer and leave them in there or file them if you don't. And uh, we'll let you know when we know, how's that? But for now, just keep them. Uh, the limitation period for lawsuits is two years. Uh, we didn't, we're still in the middle of it. So I would say for at least two years, unless you hear differently and uh, we'll go from there. Thank you both very much. That was uh, very helpful. And Emma, I'll pass it back to you. Great, thank you. Um, thank you so much, Catherine and Mike, for taking the time to record that informative and encouraging uh, presentation. We would like to present you both with a certificate indicating donations made in your names to For the Herd as a thank you for taking the time to join us today. If anyone has any questions for our speakers, now would be a great time to ask. Uh, just type your questions in the Q&A, same as before, and we'll try to get through as many as we can over the next 10 minutes-ish. Um, yeah, it's for any of, our, any of our speakers. So if you have any questions, now would be the time. All right, so we have a question for Mike. Do you see, the, do you see insurance policy rates for facilities, professionals, and horse shows increasing specifically due to COVID-19 follow? For instance, perhaps more horses have been euthanized requiring payouts. No, I, I don't. I, I see no trend that would indicate that COVID has had any direct impact on, on, on the, the cost of insurance. Um, I, I, will, I will say this though to, to everyone listening, I'm sure you've noticed, frankly, whether you're in business or not, or whether it's just your automobile insurance or home insurance, that there has been an increase in insurance rates globally, and uh, there's a host of reasons why that's happening. Um, some of it's related to COVID, but it's not specific to any one sector. 
Um, there are challenges currently in court around the world uh, surrounding business interruption coverages that aren't relevant to, to the horse industry per se, um, where insurers are, are, are preparing for vigorous defenses in courts of law around the world. Uh, so these reserves that get set up have a tendency to put burden on their financial stability. And so they, they have a tendency to look for other income streams. And when interest rates are predictably low, which they are at the moment, frankly, it's premiums that are, are their only source of income. So um, to answer the question, no, I'm not seeing any specific increase on, in, in rates specifically related to COVID in the horse sector. From a liability perspective, certainly not. Uh, property rates are going up, but it's not because of COVID. It's just because of consolidation in the industry and other economic pressures that have are being contributed to by COVID but are not directly related to it. Thank you. Uh, another question is, from a legal standpoint, if your employer works alone on the property and only with the horses, do they still need to do the COVID questions every day? Well, if the employer's working alone, I don't know who they would ask other than themselves. If, if you mean, um, you know, if someone is coming into the property, yes, they have to ask those COVID questions to people coming onto the property every day. Um, are people doing it every day? Probably not, but that's what the legislation says. Um, and I'm not going to tell you otherwise. But uh, so anyone coming on the property should answer those questions on a piece of paper, put it on a board, you know, hard board with a pen and just have it checked off and off you go. It doesn't take two minutes. Awesome. Thank you. And we have a, another question. Should we be telling our clients that we are not covered as uh, in an announcement through a newsletter, bulletin boards, is that sufficient notice? Um, sufficient notice? I'm not sure that there's an obligation for you to share um, an exclusion that might exist in your insurance policy with your customers. I think more to the point is the responsibility that you have when you invite people to a premises, your premises, to receive a service, to simply tell them of the risks inherent on being on the property just as we spoke about in the presentation. Um, I'm not sure how many business owners share the nuance of their insurance policy with their clients. Perhaps some do, I don't know that. But um, uh, again, I think it's more about the responsibility that we all have when we allow people to visit us and do business with us to make sure that they're kept safe. Um, and um, that means having conversations with them about the risks about being, uh, being on the property. Catherine, do you have anything to add to that? No, I think that's right. Okay, and just a reminder for our audience members that you can, now's the time to ask uh, any questions for any of our speakers throughout the night. And we have another question here. How many horse facilities carry WSIB? Ooh, that's not, a question. That's not a enough. Question. Yeah, not enough. <laughs> Not enough. That's a question for WSIB. I can't tell you, but I can tell you if one of your employees and or workers is injured, you're really going to hope you did carry WSIB because um, it will cost you a fortune. It's bad for the worker because you may not have the money to pay for the claim and it's bad for you because your business that you have created over so many years is going to have big problems. So um, it's, it's, very little money for a very big safety net. Please, everybody, consider WSIB. Yep, it's important. People forget about all the risks that are about, about being on a farm. It's not just about being kicked by a horse. Uh, we had a situation last year where a tractor tire went flat and somebody was standing too close to it and they got smacked in the head just as a, as a tractor listed. Fortunately, they were enrolled in WSIB. They were off for five months before they get back to work. And had it not been for WSIB, that poor soul would not have had any income whatsoever to support themselves. Um, and there are just so many risks about be, uh, being in that environment that it's a, it's a dangerous workplace, folks. It, 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 you know, as much as we take for granted that we know and, and know how to manage around horses, we're all aware of how unpredictable they can be. But by gosh, there's so many other risks on that property that sometimes we become very complacent about and we may or may not be doing adequate training to keep our, our employees safe. And uh, WSIB is a brilliant, brilliant use of your tax dollars. So 
There's my, my advocacy for WSIB. It's worth checking out, guys. It is. Right. We have another question. If we do those things that are reasonable, would we be covered in a court of law for best practice? Um, well, if you do what's reasonable and if a court says you did everything that in your industry is reasonable to do, um, that's a very good start. And most likely you would be all right, but it depends on the facts. If you did everything reasonably and something still happened that was foreseeable, and if you had just thought about it, you could have avoided, you could be liable. So we can't promise you that all the time. That's why waivers are important. That's why written contracts are important. That's why WSIB is important. And it's important that you be a responsible barn owner and operator doing everything you can, not just what you see other people doing, but if you see something else you can do that's better and safer, just do it because uh, a safe barn is a happy barn is a barn that you're going to have customers return to. Thank you. Uh, another question is for the daily COVID questionnaire, uh, is a single form with people signing underneath sufficient or does each person need to sign their own daily form? Michael? Huh. Um, I, I'm not sure I understand the question, Kyla, to be frank. It, it sounds to me like it's a question about whether or not people should be signing the form every day and the answer is yes. Um, uh, how they sign it is another question. Uh, we've had some lawyers, and I'm, Catherine, I'm not going to pinpoint you, but I, I have spoken to other counsel on this where, where we talk about electronic forms as being a way to manage that process as well. Um, and storing those forms, uh, which you made a point to earlier. Um, the, 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 the fact is that, and, and Catherine, I defer, but, but there has to be a pattern of you asking the question for it to be validated if it was ever called upon in a defense. It's not acceptable or it would seem not to be acceptable, I would guess. If I signed the form when I came to Kyla's barn on Monday, and then I signed another form on Thursday, maybe I signed a form 10 days later, and somewhere in that maze of days and weeks, I got sick. Well, Kyla shows up three forms that are days apart. It seems, it'll seem useless. Conversely, I sign the form every day. Kyle is asking me the questions every day. Are you sick? Have you traveled out of the country? Anybody in your family not feeling well? How are you feeling today? Uh, are temperature checks out of the question, Catherine? I would say not, although I don't know if somebody's, anyway, I don't know if horse barns can physically do that. But the fact is there has to be a pattern to show that you've done things that are reasonable to, to protect yourself, your family, your other customers and the environment. Um, I, I'm not sure if that answers the question, Kyla, but I, I hope it does. I believe it does. Thank you very much, uh, both Catherine Wilson and Mike King. That was very useful. And um, Emma, I'll be sending it back to you now. Awesome. Uh, thank you for answering those final questions. Um, I would like to thank all of our guest speakers for taking time out of their busy schedules to join us today. You're all truly experts in your field. And I can personally say I feel far more prepared going forward in these unfortunate circumstances. I would also like to thank our organizational committee for all their hard work. Today would not have been possible without it, without you. Um, before we wrap up for the evening, I would like to remind everyone uh, of a raffle we have going on during the symposium, including various discount codes, gift cards, um, including um, an hour trail ride provided by Conestoga River Horseback Adventures, a saddle fit evaluation provided by Schlazer Saddlery, along with many other exciting raffle items from providers such as Ontario Equestrian and Equine Guelph. Um, with attendance to the symposium, you were automatically entered into the raffle. And if you happen to fill out our pre-symposium survey, answering some questions about how the pandemic has affected you, another ticket was entered into the raffle in your name. Uh, we also have a final feedback survey. We encourage you all to fill out at the end of the week uh, where you can share your thoughts on the overall symposium. The link to the feedback survey will be emailed to you by the end of the week and uh, your response will result in another ticket being entered in your name. Uh, the final draw will take place on Monday. So make sure to fill that out. Tomorrow we'll be discussing pandemic pressures on welfare. 
Uh, then on Thursday and Friday, we'll follow with traceability and emergency preparedness and conclude with talking about the silver lining, the positive aspects of what has emerged from the pandemic. Um, thank you everyone for joining us today. Hopefully we'll see some familiar faces or I guess screens uh, over the next few evenings. Otherwise, we hope to see you next year at our next symposium. Have a lovely evening, everyone. Thank you again.